Okay, hello everybody. Thank you for coming and for waiting. Uh, we're here with the director of Brave, um, the new Disney Pixar movie. It's terrific. I saw it uh, yesterday, uh, Mark Andrews. So thanks so much for joining us. Hi. Hi. Uh, and you're a longtime animation veteran, um, uh, worked as a story supervisor on The Incredibles. Mm -hmm. I uh, worked on the story for Iron Giant, mm -hmm. um, for a couple of the Pixar shorts, One Man Band, and um, Jack Jack Attack, which are really hilarious. Um, so it's just an honor to have you here at Google, and uh, thanks again so much for coming. Sure. Um, my name's Ryan. I, I, I don't know if anybody cares, but I lead the Google Doodle team, uh, and we're all uh, Pixar sycophants on the team, and we love everything <laughs> that you guys do, and, um, and it's, again, an honor to, to have some time to talk with you. Great, great. Um, so uh, I, I re realize you also use some Google products yourself. You have a, a Blogspot blog, uh -huh. um, um, and um, it's mostly pictures of you sword fighting uh -huh. and, and videos of you sword fighting. And you also um, you sign your name Mandrews on your blog post. Uh -huh. um, is that is, do people call you Mandrews on uh, inside of pic in the Pixar universe, or is that like a yes, name? yes? That was just my my. Uh, um you know, when you get to Pixar, you get your email thing, so they just do, you know, M. Andrews, and it just turned out to be Mandrews. And so it just kind of stuck, so now I'm Mandrews. That's good. That's yeah. awesome. And so people need to email you. They just say Mandrews. Mandrews. Yeah. Awesome. And then uh, you, I read that you didn't originally plan to be an animation. You just, uh, could you kind of give us a bit of your epic journey and how you ended up in, in not just the industry, but in one of the most coveted and storied traditions in, in all of the industry. Yeah, oops. <laughs> um, uh, well, I've been drawing all my life, um, you know, ever since I was three. You know, my dad uh, worked in Linwood, California. Um, he was a school teacher and counselor and, and dean of the high school there. And he would just, I mean, the computers were just coming out, so he would bring home the reams of the white and green computer paper, yeah. you know, because they would only print whatever, you know, numbers on one side. So he'd bring home stacks of this stuff for me that was just folded, you know, reams of it. And I would just draw on it and draw on the opposite side. Um, so I've been drawing all my life and, and you know, did high school and stuff. And, I, you know, I'm not ambitious. I didn't have any aspirations to do mm -hmm. anything. Um, I didn't know what I was going to do after high school. I just drew. I was going to be a Marine yeah. uh, after high school. All my friends were going in the armed services. My best friend's in the Navy. Um, I have other friends who are in the Marines. and, and, and uh, That explains some of the sword fighting. Yes. Well, I've been doing martial arts all my life and sword fighting. Um, and... Uh, so out of high school, you know, I didn't take any college prep classes or, or nothing. So high school ends, I'm like, well, what do I do now? So I'm talking to a Marine recruiter. I'm not ready to go right into the Marines just right then and there. So I'm all, well, you know, it's City College, I guess. So I went to City College, and that's where I got my first formal training as an artist in life drawing and perspective and, and um, just drawing, you know, which was more like rendering, you know, yeah, cross hatching. Yeah. And, uh, I did two years of City College, and at this one city, this was all up in Santa Barbara, and um, uh, one class, one semester, this guy was offering this animation course, and I'd been into Japanese animation my whole life. You yeah. know, Kimba the White Lion, Speed Racer, yeah. Star Blazers, Robotech, you know, all this stuff. Akira had come out when I was graduating high school, and I'm just all, whoa, this is amazing. So I'm doing animation, this animation class, and I'm doing my own kind of anime type, you know, stuff that's just ultra violent, you know, <laughs> fun thing. And he tells me, the instructor tells me about Cal Arts, yeah. you know, which is up in Valencia, California Institute of the Arts. And I'm all, you can actually do this for a living? Wow, I better apply. So me and my brother um, applied at Cal Arts, and we got in, and I remember you know, call my recruiter, the Marine recruiter, and say, sorry, man, I'm going to art school. So uh, he's kind of upset. Um, so I did four years of Cal Arts and got my, you know, degree in film, whoopee, and uh, got out and starved for a year. Yeah. Um, what, was this, that, what, was, what was starving like for you? What did that? Oh, it was, that? it was fun. You know, it was living off a credit card and uh -huh. eating potato chips and hot dogs. You yeah. know, that was it. That was the cheapest food I could find, you know. 
that was kind of substantial. I couldn't do ramen every day. Even though you had a predisposition for Japanese culture. Yes, yeah. yes, even though I had a pre, but not a predisposition for Japanese food. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I Important. like things that are cooked. So uh, um, all my friends got uh, jobs in the animation industry, and I was the only one who did. I went to the Disney internship right out of school, and I was the only one out of five who didn't get hired because I <laughs> rocked the boat. How, I'm, I read about that, yeah. and I'm kind of curious, like, how do you rock the boat? I mean, were you a punk? Or they, were, no, was it no, the, was I was, it just, dogs, I was just me. It was the hot dogs. I was just me, and at the end of the internship, they want you to uh, kind of do a, a presentation, right? That this is what I want to do. And they're really looking, I mean, this was the height. I mean, they were animating Lion King when I was yeah. there, and they were rolling out. Pocahontas and, and Hunchback of Notre Dame and you know all yeah. these things. We were just coming off of of, uh, of uh, Beauty and the Beast, um, so it's starting to go up. up. And yeah. and DreamWorks is just being created at this time. So this was like golden age of animation. So they wanted animators because they didn't have enough. And I could animate. And but what I was really falling in love with was storyboarding. Yeah. So I was the only one out of five uh, interns who presented two presentations. And because I presented two presentations, one in animation and one in story, they don't like to make a, a decision at Disney. Okay. And that's rocking the boat. So they came and looked at it, and I thought, you know, you, you guys pick either or. I'm happy. Yeah, but they couldn't, and that just totally threw them. And so I was the only one who didn't get hired. And then I was blacklisted at Disney, and they wouldn't hire me. I mean, it sounds like, but blacklisted seems like you would have to have, like, punched somebody named Disney in the face. Or yeah, something. yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I, pissed, I, I was automatically br branded a rabble rouser <laughs> yeah, for doing like, two <laughs> presentations. And then, you know, and then I went off and starved for a year. Yeah. And then I got into TV animation. I was working at Hanna-Barbera. Well, I, I went back to CalArts where I was teaching the sword fighting class and fencing. So to make some money to eat and live, <laughs> um, and then I and then I got a job in TV. So um, so at Disney now, I mean obviously uh, Pixar is part of the Disney family. Yep. Are there people in the hallway you've got to like avert eyes with because they were you know? Like, all those people are gone. They're all gone. Yeah. Who blacklisted me? They're all gone. Yeah. And I survived. <laughs> I would imagine, and how much did sword fa fighting actually? I mean, do you, I mean that's a good survival skill. I mean, you know, even if if zombies really, attack, yeah, yeah, things really go down. I'm good. But in corporate, the, the machinery of corporate. Well, it's like the Book living. of the Five Rings, you know. You, yeah. you treat it like that, okay. kind of, you know, hit first, you know. Um, so, and then, but then you went into TV animation, but then it's still like you're kind of. I would imagine that's starting from the ground up. I mean, kind of bottom of the. Key. Yeah, the good thing about the TV animation. Um, was you're turning around, you're doing half an hour episodes yeah. in like eight weeks. So I have to storyboard a half an hour of you know stuff in eight weeks. So, and you don't get to redo it. You kind of do it, and it, it and it goes off to Korea, Japan to be yeah. animated, and that's that. And it, and then it, it, it airs on TV. So I did five episodes for the New Adventures of Johnny Quest, which is a great learning process because you just you're just doing it from your gut. Yeah, and then. Um, Warner Brothers animation started up because DreamWorks started up and it was being successful. So now everybody in Hollywood, all the studios wanted their own animation uh, business, and they still kind of do. Um, so um, and I met a bunch of uh, great people at Disney who left Disney to start over at Warner Brothers. Yeah. Um, Bill Perkins is one of them. Um, he was the um, art director on Aladdin, and mm -hmm. he's fantastic. So I got to know him with my friends who were working at Disney, you know, out of the internship. Um, and he went over uh, to Warner Brothers and called me and my brother, and he says, come on over here, guys. This is going to be wildly yeah. different. So we went over there and got um, hired at Warner Brothers and then started doing Quest for Camelot, which nobody ever saw, so don't. <laughs> and then uh, Iron Giant with yeah. Brad Bird, and that's when I met Brad Bird for the first time. And then I stayed on to do, uh, I was head of story on Osmosis Jones. And then, and then, uh, and then I got called um, to work on the first Spider-Man movie with Sam Raimi. Wow. And so I went into live action storyboarding. What was that connection? How did you get hooked up with that? Jeff Lynch, who, who was uh, my head of story on Iron Giant, yeah. um, after Iron Giant was over, you know, I'm doing Osmosis Jones for the next two or something years. He went on and Sam Raimi was starting up some movies uh, there at Warner Brothers, so Jeff got hooked up with him, and Jeff went on to be his storyboard artist and second unit director on 
you know, simple plan, the gift for the love of the game. Um, and, and then finally they, they got, there was a whole Spider-Man controversy of what studio gets Spider-Man. And Sony came out on top after, you know, getting all through the red tape. So I'm at home working on my, my uh, graphic novel, Tales of Colossus. Yeah. You guys can get at blogspot.com. Yeah, blogspot.com. Check it out. Tales of Colossus. Uh, you can get it on Amazon, $14.99. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, put my kids through school, please. No. Um, and uh, so I'm sitting there working on my, my, my comic, my graphic novel, and I get a phone call, and I pick it up, and it's Jeff Lynch. He's all, hey, I want you to come down and work on Spider-Man. I'm all, totally, I'll be down tomorrow. He's all, fantastic. I hang up the phone. I walk down the hallway. I'm telling the truth. I walk down the hallway to go back to my little office, and the phone rings again. I'm like, oh, it's Jeff telling me what gate to go to at Sony. And uh -huh. So I come back, I pick it up, and it's, you know, hello? Hey, Mark, it's Brad. Hey, Brad. Brad does the same exact imitation of me. So, <laughs> right? Brad does same the same raspy voice. The or? same raspy voice. <laughs> His imitation of me and my imitation of him is identical. So <laughs> we don't sound like this. He's like, hey, Mark. What's going on? I'm, hey, Brad, what's going on? How's it up at Pixar? Because he had just been yeah. you know, started up at Pixar. He's all, uh, how's the North Bay? He's all, oh, man, I love it. And you know what? I love it so much. I want you to come up here and head, be head of story on Incredibles. I'm all, totally, dude. I'm totally, I totally come up. I check in with my wife, and we totally move up there, work with these. All, when do you want me? He's all, uh, kind of now. I'm all, uh... I kind of accepted a job already on Spider-Man. Do you really need me? He's all, what? I'm all, yeah, Jeff Lynch called me. He's all, that Jeff Lynch. I'm also, <laughs> when do you need me? He's all, no worries, you got some time. You know, cool. uh, about nine months. So I'm all, okay, great. So I did back-to-back -back superhero movies. I boarded on Spider-Man, boarded most yeah. of that movie, and then I moved up north with my wife and uh, my newborn and, and started on Incredibles. That's and awesome. then been at yeah. Pixar ever since, 12 years. So. That's incredible. I, I am a big fan of Iron Giant. That was just like a oh, great. very Thank beautiful, wonderful you. movie. And of course, Incredibles is one of the, you know, one of my favorites of Pixar as well. Um, so uh, you weren't like a Disney guy, like died in the wool. Like you didn't, you weren't, you didn't see like Pinocchio forty-five times. No, or, no. You know, it wasn't your dream. Nine old man. Who? <laughs> I didn't. I didn't care. <laughs> and you were more of actually into like the anime, the Japanese stuff. Like what? Why? What, what, what kind of pulled you towards that as opposed to like the traditional well, or, or the yeah. resurgence of Disney animation with like Beauty the, and the Beast? The, um, um, I mean, I appreciated all that stuff and I've seen all the Disney movies, but uh, uh, to me, as a, when, I was a, when I was a kid, um, cable TV just started. It was on TV. Does anybody remember on TV? <laughs> um, it was the first cable channel ever and they had three, three kind of stations. And my uncle, who was a, a, a professional bachelor, right? He was married eight <laughs> times, like Henry VIII. He he date marriage was like dating to him. But anyway, um, he was the coolest guy ever. Sports cars, and you know. But he had on TV. He had all the best. Um, and we would, my brother um, would look at the TV guide and see what was on TV. And he's all, look, dude, the Apple Dumpling Gang is on at eight o'clock, <laughs> but at the same time on, on channel three is Mad Max, which is rated R. And we're like 10 at yeah. the time. No I'm question all, there. I'm all, dude, yeah. we got to <laughs> go over. So we would lie to our parents and lie to my uncle, and say, we want to come over and watch Apple Dumpling Gang on TV. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, sure, come on over. So my parents would drop us off. He'd go off on some date. He's like hang gliding or yeah. something. Yeah. And we'd sit there, and he, as soon as he'd leave, gung, and then we'd turn on yeah. Mad Max. So I grew up on R-rated movies when I was a kid. <laughs> so to watch Bambi or Sleeping Beauty, I'm like, ho, oh, oh, you know. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I appreciated the animation, but I could never, I could <laughs> never, you know, get behind it because yeah. of the level of the intensity of the stories. Then I find Japanese animation, and it's... Yeah, it's insane. Yeah. It's insane. I'm all supernatural beastie city. Are you kidding me? This thing's insane. Ninja Scroll? These guys are nuts. Akira? Oh my God, you know? So that was what I really appreciate about Japanese animation is that in that culture, yeah. animation isn't just for kids. Right. It's for everybody, right? It's an, it's an art form that you can tell any story in and the different levels of intensity of the story and the filmmaking behind those, you know, to create that intensity was right up my alley. But it, it maybe it was it important you actually saw that as a kid. Like so, I mean, did that 
did that impact the way you thought of children's entertainment or what children are kind of capable of enjoying? Or? Uh, totally. I think they get, I think, I mean, <laughs> I, my littlest kid, uh, he's, he's six now, four, I have four children. I have a daughter and three boys, just like Fergus in the movie. Um, but um, he, he's, he's kind of grown up with his you know, older brothers and sisters. Yeah. So he watches like Ghost Rider and Wrath of the Titans. And <laughs> you know, he's watching these movies and he'll turn to me and go, I went, what do you think, 40 is on? Is that right? <laughs> you know, PG-13 movies. But every once in a while, he'll regress. So we'll get back home and stuff, and he'll have me read him Hop on Pop. Yeah. You know, because he needs a little bit of that, too, Refresh just to time. balance, yeah, you know, just to take it down a notch. And Dr. But, Seuss is yeah. pretty cool, too. Dr. Yeah. Seuss is cool, just not violent. Yeah. Well, I mean, blood spraying, yeah, he's yeah, fine. Right. He's like, I didn't, I didn't, I, they lack the motivation. Yeah. You know, and I'm all, okay. I mean, Six year old. It, it's a funny thing, like, um, in, in, uh, in children's entertainment, there's like, you know, the Brothers Grimm, and there's yes. some pretty dark stuff historically. Yeah, like, yeah. What, what is it about professional storytellers that, that um, want to terrify children? Well, I think it's good for them to get terrified. Yeah. I mean, because that's what's coming down the pike, yeah. you know? I mean, I think we shelter our children a little too too much, yeah. you know, because we don't want to deal with the crying or, or whatever, you know, <laughs> or the nightmares or them getting out of bed and sleeping in your bed. So uh, I think what, what the Grimm's and the folk tales for it and the Aesop's fables, they're saying, look, we're going to put it in a form that you can digest, but the lesson is real because when you grow up, there's people out there that are going to hurt you, rob you, steal you, yeah. kill you, take advantage of you, yeah. and you need to be prepared so that you're not naive. Yeah and there are real consequences out there in the real world. It, it kind of shows in Brave in a way it's almost like an anti-princess you know, anti -princess story in a way. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, from top to bottom. That's one thing that we were doing because, and, and you know, um, bless Pixar for, you know, being one of these, you know, companies that is pushing the bounds of animation yeah. today yep. that they we can do something darker and because every Pixar movie there's an honesty in it. There's an Absolutely, honesty yeah. in the message. There's an honesty in the in the looking at the characters and what they have to go through. You know, we don't have a lot of villains in in Pixar. You know, movies. You know, it's it's the main characters their own problem. They have to get over, you know, their own self. You know, just like we all have issues. Um, and th there's something more real about that and relatable, yeah, right? Um, I don't have a nemesis in real life, you know? So, I, I, you know, watching movies with nemesis, you're just all, so yeah, what, totally you know? Easy. But, you know, for Brave, we were telling a darker tale and we were embracing that darker tale because it's important, this, this kid, Merida, I mean, she's on, she's a teenager, and she's on the cusp of adulthood. You know, she's at that transitionary spot. I, I like to talk, when we were making it, I like, I reference Peter Pan all the time. Yeah. But I said, it's Peter Pan with teeth. Yeah. You know, because that's that same story in Peter Pan is when he's all, you know, her biggest dilemma, she's getting kicked out of the nursery, you know, sleeping with her, her two brothers, you know, um, boo hoo. But, you know, she goes on this journey and she realizes, oh yeah, these guys are childish and idiots and stuff and I'm above, I'm ready yeah. for more. I'm, I am an adult, right? Merida has to go on the same journey, but in a more hard hitting way. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about the star of the movie. Uh huh. Which is definitely Merida's hair. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me, I want to know a little bit about the animation that went into that and the sort of symbolism of hair in this film seems to be there. Um, give, give, give me your thinking about that. Um, well, uh, you know, a movie making is a, is a visual storytelling medium. And everything that we do uh, supports the story, you know, uh, the design of the backgrounds, the design of the castle, I mean, what we're trying to, to, to say about the land, about the characters, it's all in the, the design. And for Merida, right off the bat, we knew she was going to have this um, relationship with her mother where they were at odds. And if her mother is the queen, who's going to be regal and noble, you know, wear these long flowing gowns that are bejeweled and a crown and this long hair that's tied up in this braid and she's very much in control. What's the direct opposite of that? That's yeah. the rough hewn dress that looks like it's tearing open and ripping with the puffy sleeves and, and this mass of curly, unbridled, wild hair, you know, that just had to be red because she's passionate and fierce and independent um, so that as soon as she walks out on screen, you know exactly what her story is 
without the filmmakers having to go into any exposition uh, to see what her character is like, you know, and everything that she does reinforces her her look. You know, she's spirited. She'll talk back. She does things her own way. You know, um, she doesn't make any excuses, and you know, she doesn't compromise. So we can have fun with this character and really get behind her and get behind that look. And it's it's really iconic and dynamic as much as she is. So I saw uh, the extra clips in, um, in um, for The Incredibles, mm -hmm. and in that you have very closely cropped hair, maybe more yep. like marine style. Yeah. Um, now you're growing your locks a bit. Like, what does what does your hairstyle tell about your character? Well, you know, since it takes place in the Middle Ages, um, uh, I just wanted to grow my hair out, you know, to just kind of grow it out and yeah. be in the spirit of the movie. I, I instituted, uh, when I came on board to direct, Kilt Fridays. Mm -hmm. So everybody started buying up kilts and we wore our kilts every Friday, uh, at, at, you know, at work. So, you know, it's just, it's just to motivate, you know, yeah. and, and cause we know we're, I mean, we're working on something, everybody's been working on it for a long time to kind of keep that passion and that energy going yeah. because it ain't, it ain't done yet is, you know, you kind of go out of your way to kind of do these things, to kind of pick up the energy and, and things, because we knew we had something very special with this movie, and everybody who was working on it um, really dug it and knew they were working on something special and something kind of new, and we were pushing the boundaries of what we had done before, because we had hair, yeah. and we've had cloth and, and simulators and stuff, we just never had this much before um, to the levels that we're doing it. I mean, even the backgrounds with our, our effects team is, uh, was amazing. The stuff that they had to do um, in the movie that's pretty much invisible, you yeah. know? Um, rain and water and the fire is hard as hell to do. I mean, there's lots of organics yeah. to sell this kind of time period and place, and that's everything that the computer hates, is yeah. the computer hates organics. It wants straight, clean, Tron-like lines, you know? Yeah. They're, they're, uh, so we're, you know, Google's kind of a nerdy company, lots of engineers. Mm -hmm. I, I heard in another interview you were speaking about you, you guys rewrote almost the entire software apparatus yeah. for this. Like, yeah. What went into that? Well, I mean, it, it was 25 years old, yeah. right? Um, so we don't even have cars that are 25 mm -hmm. years old, you know, without hefty overhaul. So it was time at the studio they decided that we needed to revamp the system and, and, and kind of create it anew and, yeah. and give us all these more powerful tools and stuff like that. So, but when do you do it? We gotta make a movie, right? We gotta use this software. So Brave kind of got assigned to do that. And, and you know, everybody said, yeah, okay, yeah, let's do it. Um, which kind of added to the development of Brave because we're developing a software system at the same time, yeah. you know, so that kind of made the movie, you know, in production, uh, uh, increase the length that it was in production to make up the stuff. I mean, the software just to do her hair was two, two years to develop, yeah. you know. Um, the water, so there's a scene uh, where they're playing in this river, you know, um, to do that scene, it took a year just to do the water effects for that scene. I'm uh, sure, yeah. yeah. Um, it just took a long time. But there's lots of other stuff. There's animation controls and things that we do with rigging. We had to rewrite the software that we had for her hair um, to create the hair, just create the hair. And then we had to have a whole new software package to move the hair and simulate the hair that went into the dresses and the clothes and stuff. And if you look at Incredibles, the first time that we were really doing humans throughout the, the movie, we had hair and we had cloth sims sure. and they were wrestling matches to do it. And that was just a super suit, you know, that was nothing. It was one one layer. And Violet had that just long straight straight hair, just long. Um, and the Merida has all this big curly locks and everybody's got seven layers of clothing on. Yeah. Fergus has got seven layers on. That's all simmed and it's all talking to each other and stuff, you know, and reacting to each other. So we've come, we've come a long way since, you know, Incredibles. So, I mean, I, I, it seems that story is the sort of, um, story leads, leads the, leads the mm -hmm. way at Pixar, mm -hmm. which, is, which is I think why your movies are so incredible, it's mm -hmm. so special. Uh, have there ever been times where you tell the engineers you want to do something and they curse at you or kick and scream and like what, what's an example right. of where they told you like you're insane uh, do they just have to take a walk and suck it up or or is it something that um, they actually can win a battle or two 
Um, they they never say no um, <laughs> because they like the challenge too. You yeah. know, I, I mean, who wants to work on the same old thing all the time? Yeah. You know, uh, that's one thing that I really like about Pixar as a company is that they never want to plateau. You know, they never want to be comfortable. As soon as they get comfortable and they get complacent, we're not going to be doing good movies at all, you know? So we constantly want to push it. And the technology is always driven by the story. So we show up and we go, we want to do this thing in Scotland with hair and kilts. They're all, and they go, okay. How do we do that? And they go over here and, and talk. You know, I'll be in the room and I'll say, I want wolves, and I walk out. <laughs> and they'll be all, how do we do wolves? You know, and they start <laughs> talking and drawing diagrams and math comes out, you know, which is one reason I leave the room, sure. you know, and technical diagrams. And, you know, we have physicists and, you know, all kinds of people that are working at um, Pixar. One of our sim, sim guys made a nano to radio at, at Berkeley. That's what he did before coming to work. I'm all, how does this compare? He's all, this is so much more fun. I'm all, oh, okay, just making things go, you know, like this, yeah. you know. But, um, but they love the challenge and, 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 and they go for it and they'll come back uh, and say, we can't do it, you yeah. know. Um, but we can't do that, but we got this other thing, you know, and then you find ways of, of, of getting, getting what you want. But they, they usually don't say, you know, throw down their fists and, and pound the table and, and yeah. get upset. They're like, how do we do that? You well, know? They know you're a sword fighter. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'm super intimidating at yeah. work. <laughs> yeah. What you... Um, how do you, you mentioned Kilt Fridays mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and other ways you try to keep the crew motivated. Mm -hmm. um, how, you know, it's a, a very long development cycle for a, for a film compared to it can be, yeah. what we work on sure. at Google. Um, so, you know, how do you, keep, how do you sustain the excitement like yours in, you know, to keep people like as motivated as right. fresh? Because when it comes out, it seems like, you know, uh, this is, you know, beautifully crafted thing. And you don't get a sense of the labor. Right. And you shouldn't. Yeah. Uh, um, but I mean, it's just, I think, I mean, for me, I like the challenge. I like the problem solving aspect of, of story. You know, how do you take uh, an idea or develop an idea from scratch and get an audience to care about it and emote and react, you know, to it. And there's, you know, a billion and one ways to skin a cat. You know, there's so many potential ways to go on a movie, you know, to show off a, a character or to describe this bit of information, um, but what's the right way so that everything falls in line and the audience is, is, is with you, you know, and is crying or laughing or, or on the edge of their seats. So I love that problem. And I think everybody at Pixar kind of has that fascination to solving the problem, yeah. you know? Um, and especially when we have these stories that we ourselves dig and we're fans of. We're our, our harshest critics at Pixar. We, we put up the movie and, and storyboard reels and we watch it, everybody together, and we go, that totally blew. What did we do wrong? And we tear it down and we do it again. And we do this constantly. Um, look at it because, uh, you know, one of the lessons we learn is that there's, the proof is in the pudding. So you can talk about it all you want of what the scene should be or what the story should be or the direction you should go, but until you actually see it playing in time in context with everything involved working or not working, um, that's when you know. I mean, every, you guys all see movies, right? You guys all see movies? How many people saw a sucky movie recently? <laughs> yeah? What do you do after you see a sucky movie? Gripe about it. You gripe about it, right? You talk about it and you talk about what they should have done, right? That they dropped the ball or I wasn't invested or I wasn't interested. That's what we do all day. That's my job, yeah. is to make a movie, a sucky movie, look at it and then gripe about it, and say, man, they didn't have any motivation. That character was totally pointless in the movie. Why did they go here? They should have gone here. <gasps> and then take it down and, and do it again and stick it back up and go, less sucky. But still, the ending, I'm not, I don't care, you know, and then you take it back and put it back up. And that's, and that's what we do. Uh, you, you mentioned all the details that go into the mm. Pixar films, and I just want to say that they're appreciated. Like, it's really wonderful to see so many things put together, and, you know, the, one of the triplets lip-syncing to the, to the story is awesome, because the triplets don't 
don't speak to the whole film. But right. That's the one time they get to speak, and there's yeah. just there's just so many terrific moments like that. I'm looking forward to seeing it, seeing it several times actually. Um, you you mentioned I've heard you say a few times that uh, story is hell. Yeah. Um, why is story so hard? Um, uh, it's the 666th layer of the abyss, uh, because you can't you can't pin it down um, because there's so many possibilities, and what's the right possibility? And you know we kind of go into it intellectually of what we need it to be about these characters and and their purpose and how do we get the information to the audience, you know, in an economic and clear kind of way so that they get all these ideas and the themes and they have an experience. Um, that's a tall order, you know, and it's trial and error. I mean, the hard work, I, I teach too. I teach visual storytelling and storyboarding. Um, and, you know, my students are always asking me for the silver bullet. What's the silver bullet? What's the silver bullet? What's the secret? I'm all the secret is just a lot of hard work. Yeah. It's banging your head against the concrete until you make a hole you know, in the wall and you can go through is, is yeah. basically what it is. Um, you just have to try stuff on for size and see that it doesn't work and try it again and try it again and try it again. You know, Michelangelo talked about looking at the big thing square of marble and, and seeing the inside. We don't know what it is. The story does, we don't know what it is on, on the inside. You know, we we'd start chipping at marble and then we'd ruin that entire piece of marble going, I don't want David, I want, oh, now I know what I want, and we'd start on another piece of marble, you know? Um, it's, I like to refer to it as alchemy. We're changing yeah. lead to gold, and as soon as we have gold, we go, ha ha, yes, how do we do that? I don't remember, I have no idea what the formula was, and we can't replicate that formula, so every time we go into another movie, it's a new set of problems, it's a new set of variables, and it's different every time. I mean, there are, there are, um, you know, you have all these experiences from making the movies. You know, I have my executive producers, John Lasseter and Andrew Stanton, and Peak Doctor, they're walking around with their Academy Awards. <laughs> you know, they bring them into the office and say, Kunk. okay, you're gonna do it this way, buddy. Um, they don't do that, but, um, but they have all this experience. So they kind of know where the pitfalls are kind of before you get there. Um, but they also don't have all the answers either, or else these films would not take the time that it takes to do them, and we'd be out the door, you know, with five films a year, you know, no problem. Yeah. Um, but it, it, everything, it, it's difficult. It's really, really, really difficult. Do you ever worry that the scenes are going to show? Or, I mean, is that, what, what, is that, your, is that a, a fear for you when the movie's going to come out that people, you know? Like, oh, yeah, there's tons of stuff in here that yeah. the, the <laughs> seams are showing, you know, and I'm just going, <laughs> you know, is anybody, is the audience going to notice, you know? Um, because again, we're our own harshest critics. We know what's half-baked, you know, sure. and what's not, you know, fully cooked. You know, it's that scene in Tucker, the movie Tucker, where they present the car, you know, to show it off, but it, it, it doesn't have an engine on it and it can't <laughs> even move. You know, that's kind of how, how we feel sometimes because it's not, you know, you can still work on it, or is that the best solution I had for that moment, or for sure. to, or to tell that story, or that that part of the story? You know, because there could have been something just around the corner. Right. You know, um, and that's the other thing. I, I like working in the parameters, and that's what I learned from TV. Is that sure. if you don't have time, you kind of get more creative, and and what what really happens is you get more objective. Yeah. So you're willing to kill your babies faster. You know, it's like you make a baby and you kill it because that's not you didn't want that one, yep. right? Um, and I know it's a violent process. No, we do. We, Story's a violent process. And even in a Google Doodle, you have yeah. the letters, and we kill babies all the time. Oh, yeah. You're going, no, no. I yeah. mean, when I used to work on paper, um, I wouldn't even bother, when I, did, when I did a drawing, I wouldn't even bother putting it in the trash can. Yeah. I'd be working so <laughs> fast, it'd be, no, no, no. Ooh, that's interesting. Save. No, no. And you come into my room, and it's wall to wall. Sure drawings. The animators would come in and pick through the drawings of these rough, half-baked ideas and steal them and go away, you know. And every once in a while, every three months, I'd, I can literally roll up my floor. I yeah. start at one corner because they're all interlaced, all these pieces of paper, and I just start rolling it up. And I walk out with a six-foot roll of storyboards and dump it in the trash. 
Yeah. You know, but it's it's that it's being it's being objective. It's finding the thing, the kernel of an idea that I get excited about as an audience. I have to be the audience and sure. go, oh, oh, I love that. What does this mean? I don't know yet, but it's something. And then I'll figure out how to 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 put it in. And then so years of effort, many six foot tubes of drawing. Yes. Um, a film comes out. What what does success mean to you? Like how do, how do you feel like I job well done? I mean, you've, and you've been part of so many incredible right. films. Right. Right. Um, I think when we have a, um, our wrap party, sure. you know, and and the crew is seeing it finished, totally completed, and they're laughing and crying and on the edges of their seats because they're the harshest critics, yeah. you know, and they come up to me and they said, I love the movie. Oh my gosh, that was so great. They could be lying in my face, <laughs> but I hope they're not. And and so when they say, I love the movie, oh my gosh, it was so good. You know, when I have Brad Bird going, Mark, no, really. You know, that, then I've, I've done my job. And when John's sitting there going, ah, ha, 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 and tears are in his eyes, yeah. you know, a multi Academy Award winner, you know, I, 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 done. I have done my job and I'm ready to get on to the next one. If, I, it, if it comes out and it doesn't make a dime, I don't care. Yeah. I, I cried. I'm not, I'm, I'm not enough to admit I cried, but I hedged my bets because my girlfriend was sitting next to me <laughs> and I sort of tilted my head. Yeah. So the tear, like, it was like more of like a single tear going yeah. on the side, and she wasn't. Uh, she, she, she didn't heard, see it. She heard me sniffling. She's like, yeah. are you, "Oh, you're crying," and I'm like, and then I could do like the sort of like, you know, thumb. Right, right, right with worked, your drink. But I, I think the movie was a <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's like a straw, like for a yeah. moment, suck it up. Um, but I think the movie is going to be a big success in any way you slice it because it's terrific and and. Again, uh, thanks so much. I think now we can open up for questions. Uh, I've satisfied my immediate curiosities, and um, anybody in the audience, we also have some, uh, wow. there's some questions online that we can sure, ask as well. Sure, sure. Hi, uh, my name's Tyler. Um, so coming from perspective of a, of a storyteller, an animator, and a storyboarder, how do you adjust that when it comes to 3D, now that 3D is an aspect? Does that have an effect on, on the story at all? Um, yeah, that's a great question. It's uh, 3D is is just another visual tool, right? Um, when I saw, uh, I don't like 3D particularly because I think there's weird things happening with my eyeballs, you know, because I'm already seeing depth and then you're putting this kind of fake depth on there. Um, but when I saw Avatar, right, because James Cameron, I love James Cameron, and he loves 3D. I'm going, why does he love 3D? But when I see Avatar, what he was doing with the 3D, you know, I'm pulling off my glasses, watching it, going, there's no 3D in this scene. There's no, oh, there's 3D. Oh, there's no 3D here. He's using it to, as a tool to help tell the story, you know. He's using it to impact the experience, the emotional ride, the, the, you know, when there's a lot of depth because the character is going through some intense moment, he cranks up the 3D, and when it's just talking heads, he doesn't, you know? Or when there's, you know, lots of things crossing to enhance that visual space, you know? He's using it as a tool, like I use color, or the camera move, or editing, or design, you know? Um, these are all visual tools to help tell the story, so that when we were doing 3D, on this, um, uh, with Bob Whitehall, our, our stereographer guy, um, see, the, no school, <laughs> art school. Uh, Same here. Our stereographer, um, you know, I was, I would always, you know, we look at the pieces. I go, okay, okay, here, I, I want almost zero depth because it's not dynamic. You know, here she is riding through the forest. We're totally done out. I want all the depth you can give me, you know, and dialing in and out of that so it, it balloons. Because if it's 3D all the time and depth all the time, then what is that statement to the viewer? You know, it, that would be like listening to something on absolute loud all the time. And there has to be variation and rhythms, just like there are variation and rhythms in the storytelling. So the visuals have to support the story, and so 3D is just another tool to help do that. That's how I'm using it anyway. I'm, you're not gonna catch the same thing on Clash of Titans or anything like that. 
Yes. Hi, I have a couple questions that were submitted over the internet, and they're similar, so I'll read them together. Um, Pablo from Vancouver says, hi, as a screenwriting student, I would like to know how the writing process of Brave was. I see four people have screenwriting credits. Did it change when you joined as director? And also Connor from Sicklerville, New Jersey, wants to know how much did the story change since its original conception in 2008? Great. Um, good questions. Uh, how the story changed. The bones has always been the same uh, of the story. Um, Brenda Chapman, um, my fellow director who started the project, it was her original idea and concept um, that was based off of her experience as a parent with her six-year-old daughter who's this very uh, feisty, spirited, willful, talk-back child at six. So she kind of projected ahead to when her daughter was going to be a teenager and kind of went, oh my God, what is this gonna be like? So it was that kind of core relationship of that parent-child during these very you know, transitional time period as a teenager um, was always at the heart of the story. Setting it in Scotland was always at the heart of the story. Um, and that uh, this magic that was going to happen in the story, I don't wanna ruin it for anybody who hasn't seen the movie, we're keeping the secrets, um, was always part of the story. Um, and like I was talking about before, how exactly do you tell that story? You go in and out and you try different things. There was this, um, there was competing characters uh, at, at one time, Merida, um, mom and dad were kind of competing for Merida, you know, in a sense. Is Merida gonna be more like her dad, Fergus? Or is Merida gonna be more like her mother? And they were kind of pulling her attentions. Um, and those types of things. So when I, when I came on, um, what I did was there was this kind of like 18 month uh, deadline and wow. the story wasn't, wasn't going. It wasn't where it needed to be at 18 months before we were released. So, and this had happened before on Ratatouille, on Toy Story 2, we've had director changes at Pixar before. Um, and Pixar will do whatever it's necessary to tell that great story, whether it's push back the release date, or unfortunately have a director change. Um, so Pixar asked me to jump on board uh, to take over directing on Brave. And so what I did is I looked at it as an adaption, right? I had just come off adapting uh, John Carter of Mars and writing that with Andrew. So I looked at it as an adaption where there's things that definitely worked in the story and things that didn't. So clearing those out kind of left spaces. And I can do that coming in and being objective because it wasn't mine, right? I didn't, I didn't create it. Um, so that left, that left holes, right? Uh, to go to the comment about the script writing, there were still elements of the script that were kept, and then I wrote the script um, uh, with Steve Purcell, uh, who was the, you know, the original co-director with, with Brenda. So there was a continuity there, but we would rewrite the script. I mean, the, 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 and lots of scenes. More do, that whole element mm -hmm. came up what the, exactly the magic was and how it worked, changed. And the main thing I did was uh, made it just merit a story, just made it about the teenager so I could have that straight through, through line and kind of cl clean up the, the balance of the story because there was a lot of characters drawing the balance away from the main, the main conflict. So the screenwriting process is, uh, again, it's trial and error, you know. I write, I pass it out to the storyboard guys, they visualize it, so they storyboard it and put it up, and then we look at the scene and I go, no, 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 it doesn't work, let's try this, that, and the other thing. They do the notes, I put it in editorial, we watch it as it's timed and edited, I'm going, you know, that line doesn't work, and da, 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 and you constantly are in the state of evolution and changing it, you know. Those are, I'm curious about, those are big changes, you know, top down yeah, kind yeah. of direct, director changes. What about this, the kind of bottom up changes like that, um, you know, gags that come in from the story artist? Or right, right. Does that ever like turn into a, a, a dramatic shift in the story or like a tone of the scene? Or sure. How does that go down? Yeah, absolutely, because we're constantly looking for what the entertainment is, you know, of the scene. So is there a chance to make it funny or, or, or it's not really working? Well, because you know, the, the, the action of the situation isn't entertaining. So yeah. let's change the action of the situation. Oh my gosh, it, it's totally entertaining. Um, uh, I can't use this one. Oh, yes I can. So, so there's this one idea that we had where 
mom is griping to Fergus about her daughter, sure, right? Because right. the parents always talk about the kids, right? When the kids are away or in bed, right? We cool. always talk about this. Yeah. This is a cool thing. And, and Merida had her own scene where she's griping and worried about her future of this getting married and being pushed into this. And they were two separate scenes. And we knew we had to have this information because we need to get behind the mom and we need to understand what Merida's uh, you know, fears were and her concerns about losing herself. But they were two separate scenes and they had been for a while. And it was this huge road bump. Like how do we get, they're not working, but the information is right. You know, we have to have this information. So we're arguing about it in, in the story room, yeah. right? Me and the story guys. Just hammering on and hammering on and hammering on. I'm all, wait, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. Because somebody goes, well, if they just talked to each other, the movie would be over. <laughs> That's true. And I'm all, why don't we have them talk to each other? And they're all, what? I'm all, let's have them talk to each other. They're all, what are you talking about? I'm all, listen. And then I pitched them the scene in the movie where uh, Eleanor, the queen, is talking to Fergus as if Fergus was Merida. And Merida is talking to her horse as if the horse was Eleanor. But I intercut that conversation so they're talking to each other. And it instantly made it super entertaining and we got all the information out in this very economical way. Those things happen all the time, right? And that's, that's that gold when you find it, you're all bingo, boom, done. And when everybody saw it, they're all woohoo. Yeah. Awesome. I hope that answers your questions, <laughs> internet guys. <clears throat> Hi. Um, every few years there seems to be um, either a trend or a breakthrough uh, in effects yep. uh, that, that centers around a certain technology. Like 10, 15 years ago it was cloth and hair yeah. and then uh, uh, crowd simulations, you know, wet and digital and uh, compositing and particle system and voxels and right. all these kind of things. Uh, and it sounds like you rewrote everything for Brave. Um, what would you say the next either challenge or trend is? in or, or uh, big challenge for for animators right especially in, around effects right like what's the most difficult thing that people are, are trying to uh, attack right now right well uh, that's a great question um, I know that we're working on lighting right mm -hmm. now uh, real interactive high-speed lighting so that because in animation I can't just put we turn on these lights right. they hitting me they're hitting you they're bouncing across the floor the bounce bounce light from the floor is hitting the chairs, it's lighting the chairs, we've got the sunlight coming in from there. I mean, everything's splashing around and doing stuff for free. We don't need to do anything, right, in real life. Uh, in animation, that's its own light, and what it's doing to me, I, I have to have another light, and what it's doing to the wall, I have to assign a quality to that wall so that it operates the way that this paint should versus the carpet, you know, all that stuff. So what they're trying to do right now is develop like real light source reacting so that everybody already has an assigned thing. So when the, the, the computer turns on the light in the virtual world, it'll go, oh, plastic chair, carpet, skin, Levi's, right? right. Watch reflective surface, you know, all that kind of stuff, and you kind of get it for free so we don't have to manipulate and put all these little lights, these invisible lights, all over the place. So I know they're working on that. But that is just a small step to get towards the bigger step, which is context, right? Animation is movie making in slow motion because we're constantly building the context. We get nothing for free. So what they're trying to do is, when the animators get it, it looks like done and can animate done with the lights done and the set done so we could look at it constantly in context. So I think that is the next big step. So you mean like animating in a real time render? Animating in a real time render and there's some gaming companies that are kind of doing this already <clears throat> with their game engines. Mm -hmm. They're making movies or cinematics in the game that they built. I, I saw Half-Life and I'm all, Half-Life 2, I'm all, whoa! I mean, the things, my gun's shooting and it's moving stuff on the walls and it's interactive and it's real, it's real time. And I'm all, we can make a movie in this. 
people are actually doing that. You know, they'll play the zombie game and they'll have one guy out there zipping zombies with their cheated, you know, bazooka gun while the crew is inside actually shooting on the set. <laughs> it's crazy. You know, they're using the game engine so they can bring in the animation and have the guys stand around and, and they have to go back and touch, you know, for lip sync and things like that. But they can move the camera rounds and they shoot coverage and things and they, they're on the walkie talkies going, okay, I'm coming in now, get ready and action. And they do all this stuff just like you do. So that's fantastic. And, and that's, that's the kind of stuff that I, I want to do, you know, using motion capture to get to those answers quicker, right? Because we could go down so many paths you know, when I was shooting live action on, on John Carter, you know, we had spontaneity like this, you know, all the time. You know, I could tell um, Taylor Kitsch or, or, or Lynn Collins, I'm like, no, 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 come in, come in uh, different. You, uh, even more, you know, frazzled and, and, and harried. This is, you know, the life is on the line. You know, come in, you're totally defeated. Now, okay, that, that's good. I got that one. Come in totally defeated. And you're finding the scene in the context. In animation, we have to <laughs> build the context and then find the scene as we're going along. You know, we have to put in the serendipity, right? So any camera shake or out of focus things that you see in an animated film isn't a mistake. I wanted it in there to give it that organic feel. So I think the next big technological feat is we're gonna be making animated films in context. Do you think that's gonna shorten the amount of time it takes to make an animated film or just give you You would more? think that it would, <laughs> but it's Never probably does. not. <laughs> if, Thank you. Uh, thank you. If, uh, follow up on that. If, you, if, if story is really the most important thing, yes. and you can tell a story with stick figures, yes. why spend ungodly sums of money and years to get the realism and the type of wall you need? Uh, because the, sti the stick figures, that you, it, it would have to be a really, 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 really fantastic story <laughs> to get carried away with stick figures. Sure. I don't think a story exists that can get you carried away with stick figures. Um, where we're compelled by what we're watching and we want to be transported, you mm -hmm. know? Um, so, which is why, I mean, they have motion pictures, you know, and they get a camera out there and we can emote with these real life people on experiences we don't normally have. Um, I mean, there are things that work. I mean, you watch the old Peanuts things and old cartoon right, things right. And, and you're feeling for these things that are very simple. Um, but that can only go so far. Um, so when we're making movies and we're sketching, you know, that's just the rough idea to, to, because I'm projecting ahead, you know, with what it's going to, to look like. And that, once the audience finally sees it all done and, and lit and everything like that, they are transported to, to, to that place, to that world with these characters, you know, and they're, they're really living it. Yes, sir. Well, we just have time for one more question, and it'll be Justin. So I saw the Japanese trailer for Brave on YouTube. And the impression one gets of the movie is a lot darker, more mystical, and consequently more interesting right. than the American trailer gives. Right. Um, and so, you know, it's, it just seems unfortunate with all of Pixar's success in making animated features that appeal to adults, they still have to be marketed to kids. Do you see any indication that that's changing over time or will change oh, down yeah. the road? Oh, yeah, I, I think so. I mean, uh, the Japanese audience is a very different audience than the American audience just like the Russians are very different, and, and the French, you see the French things, uh, it's crazy. Um, uh, the, you know, the Norwegians are very different, you know. Um, so the marketing people have a challenge to how do I take this one movie and give it these different guises to appeal to all those different markets to get their butts in the chairs because um, that's what they need to do. We need that awareness. We need to get the butts in the chair so they can see it, spend their moolah, you know, love it, hopefully see it again, spend more moolah so we can keep making, you know, movies. Um, <clears throat> I think, so the reason our trailers are done here the way they are is pretty much is what the audience wants. It's what they react to, you know? Um, and it's, again, it's this, weird alchemy of, you know, kind of predicting what the audience needs. I've been doing a lot of PR, doing my, you know, I'm here with you guys today, um, but to talk more about the movie. But one thing that I keep getting from journalists um, is they're very impressed with 
how much, after they've seen the movie, how much of the movie is not in any trailer, right? How much we're keeping stuff, we're withholding things and keeping a secret. And, you know, I really have to give, you know, our Disney marketing teams and, and, and Pixar for wanting to, to do that a lot of props because I want to give the audience uh, a ride, you know? I want to give them an experience. It'd be like telling your kid on Christmas, here, I got you that thing that you wanted, the, the Lego Death Star. Go ahead and unwrap it. They'd be like, yeah, it's a Lego Death Star. Thanks, you know. I want to unwrap it and find it, you know, and discover it. And that's what a movie is. When you go in, you should know just enough to have gotten you in the seat and then not know what to expect beyond that, that it could go anywhere. And I think a lot of trailers today uh, all over the world for all kinds of audiences, especially American audience, they say everything about the movie, you know? You get the beginning, middle, and end. You're just going, you know? And if it's a comedy, forget it, because you saw all the most funny parts. So when you go and see the movie, you're all, well, I saw all the funny parts in the trailer. What's left? A this? Why did I come see this? I thought there was going to be more, you know? So by withholding that information, you know, in the trailer, especially on, on a Brave trailer, uh, you know, it's giving the audience that. And I think that is the first step, to go to your question, that's the first step in kind of pushing that boundary of trusting the filmmakers and the film that, you know, they're going to put out there. That an audience doesn't need much. I mean, I was ready to see Prometheus. I didn't need to see any hear any talking at all. Just those images, I was captivated, you know? Um, and that's the kind of thing that, that gets me. And I think uh, the more audiences respond to that, then the, the, the feedback and the pie charts, you know, will come back to the marketing, you know, folks, and they'll go, oh yeah, these, these things were hits, you know? Um, they, it got them into the, into the theaters to see this movie with less, you know? So I'm a big believer of less is more, so that you, the audience, have, have the more when you see, see the movie. So without adding any more. Without adding any more. Um, do yourselves a favor and go unwrap the gift that is Brave. It's an awesome movie. And yep. thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. And hope to have you back next time you make one of your Absolutely, films. absolutely. All right. See you online, guys. <laughs>